Yes, sir. There we go. Thank you guys, FS Medical, for putting on such a great spread and doing our, our training and presentation. Is Beth on? Uh, we're about to we're about to ask. I know she's on. I just want to make sure everybody can hear us. Okay. So Ryan Ryan's reaching out to her right now. Um, probably where I always get nervous, but uh, uh, so the technology side. Brian, uh, you know he's always been there on the other side of the phone for me. Um, I appreciate you guys as a company and um, uh, the one tech. I know his name. I just Rick. Just Rick. Rick's been around forever. Rick, and, uh, um, yes, sir. Thank you. So I'm giving you guys an attaboy because uh, you know you guys have been around and we've you know we've experienced service and and uh, it's always been a good a good thing. And we appreciate you paying our bills too. <laughs> well, thank Karen for that. Both ways. But uh, as everybody else here, um, welcome to the CC meeting. Um, I know we have a, a, some stuff planned that's coming up. Uh, next week will be golf. I know that uh, these guys will say more about that, but uh, um, Gary's really been working hard on something uh, we haven't done for probably two years, three years. Three years. Robert, that softball tournament, yes. You want to talk? Did you bring it? I did bring it. So, yeah. Have it. So actually, this tournament is scheduled for uh, October fifteenth, and our Saturday, October fifteenth, it'll be in Ramona. Uh, just putting it all together. Uh, we're trying to get teams together. We would like to have at least ten teams. Um, we'll be sending out the rules and regulations. TRL signed us uh, promoting two teams. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Children's will be another team. Uh, you guys have a team? Yeah. Anyway, we're working on getting the teams together. So that'll be October 15th on Saturday. It'll be an all day event. In Ramona. In Ramona. Ramona softball field. So we'll send out information related to that to let you know the address and everything. It starts at 8 o'clock in the morning on Saturday. Well, there's one thing I would like this vendors. I know there's a. Uh, Really like it if you guys could try to coerce engineers to come. Yeah, I love seeing you guys, but this kind of training is something that we need, engineers need. And um, I'm gonna have to yell at my guys for not showing up, but I was just speaking earlier, you know, I've gone through some of that training, but I've always been leery to touch anything, but really seeing it on the bench and over there, really, it was very helpful. Uh, I think this would be great for everybody, but I do wish we had more engineers as there's a lot of stuff coming up. If you speak to some of your vendors, um, see she's having mech training of which Mr. Corky will talk about. Are you done? Yes, I am. Okay, so uh, September 15th, we have the 29th annual Southern California seminar. Again, TRI. <laughs> A summit like we do at the Angle Institute, which is oftentimes in Northern California or some of the far. This is Long Beach. And yes, we're going to do uh, mech training. If you're not familiar with mech training, it's uh, it's it's one of the, 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 we are an educational society. That is what we do. We're here for the benefit of uh, hospital engineers. Being vendors and participating is just something we get to do to support hospital engineers. And so I have you should be if you're who's not a member here who is not a art carrying cc member okay so we're going to ask that you do join cc right 150 bucks to uh, participate in all this this is absolutely true this is atrocious these wonderful people have uh, stepped up last minute dale thank you uh to host this yeah. and we and this is like pitiful attendance just horrible so we as uh as you can tell i'm not too shy about shaming people so uh, I'm going to go out back out to the engineers and, and identify what the heck. Uh, they'll Watch certainly that. show up for a Padre game. They'll show up for uh, the golf tournament. Golf tournament sold out. But we're an educational society. We 
do all these other things. So it's fun. And then we want to make sure that everybody knows the latest and the greatest. So that's what the uh, 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 Southern California 29th Annual Southern California Seminar is all about. There are changes in healthcare all the time with the COVID and with, and with OSHPOD, which isn't OSHPOD anymore. Now it's each page. There you go. Thank you. I'm old. <laughs> and, uh, and, and everything else that goes along with it, it's just a constant battle to stay up on it. And CISHI makes a point of making sure that you're aware of all this stuff. But so on their website, anybody that is on it, you know, Beth does a wonderful job of, uh, she presents all the training. So for all the classes that you would be taking to get your certif certification, yeah, I said that a lot. Your certificate. There's training, so you so you're ready, and it, it's really really good. Uh, it's out there. You just need to. It's 139 bucks if you're off, if you're a hospital uh, facility member. Uh, for uh, affiliates like us, it's 189 bucks. Mm -hmm. So really ask that you. Uh, man, oh, I'm sorry. No, you go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, during the golf tournament, we've got 144 people or whatever coming out. A lot of why don't we do like I don't know if we have a QR code or something like on our booths like we're supporting the seventh wall and we'll be talking to people but like when they come up and then it highlights some of the events or the educational sessions that are coming up and I know you send things out via email and stuff sometimes people get bombarded or I don't know about the engineers if they're looking at that but maybe instead of handing out like paper and saying hey you know come or you could even do that but or you could have a QR code where they could scan it and it would show them like upcoming events to register or link. I'm looking at my brilliant 26 year old daughter going, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, her 62 year old dad is not going to do well, that. Like, well, it's just a, it's a QR code. How many of you know how to read menus now because of COVID with a QR code? It's the same. Concept. I just did a cruise. That's the only way they do it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so you're right. I was just saying, because they're in front of us, it's just like I was just thinking, we have a Jenga game and they pull a Jenga and if it has a sticker on it, we give them a lottery ticket on our poll just to make it fun. Love but it. maybe those are questions about Sushi and oh yeah, Love did you know, blah, 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 or whatever, just to tie it in and have, you know, just because they're going to be in front of us and um, to invite them to come to the next session sometime. Beth, I hope you're listening. <laughs> I promised I'd promote it. Now here we're at home. Well, this is going to be right in front of us. So, yeah. Okay. Hey, can you guys hear me at all? Yes. 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 Thanks, Beth. Wonderful. Um, so, I'm, the ideas are great. I love them and I'm, I'm taking notes. Um, but I wanted to let you know I have Ben on here on the line and he's had his hand up for a minute. I think he has a question. Yeah. Does he have any money? <laughs> <laughs> Ben, are you are you there uh, to ask your question? Ben? I think Ben has no money. Yeah, I think he. <laughs> ben, who? <laughs> All right. Well, let's come back to Ben. Anything else, Beth? Nope. Nothing else on my end. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. That's what it's about. Uh, and Beth, Jimmy and Gary and I are looking at carpooling and go. What did I do? No, I was looking at my. Oh, you're you're going up. <laughs> and uh, going up together, and then TRL is going up as well. So we're going to work on getting the San Diego contingent to go up and storm the uh, seminar. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, um, so so we have a couple of other things real quick. So next week on Thursday is the golf tournament. It is a sellout. There's nothing stopping you from coming out and joining us, even though you can't golf. There are going to be uh, uh, holes of food and alcohol, and it's just going to be one heck of a big party. And uh, we invite you to do that. We are looking for somebody to uh, take care of October festivals. Every year, a vendor will host Oktoberfest. That's the only time we're allowed to say the word beer. So, uh, so we're looking for somebody to do brats and beer. Last year was Alliance. Yes, they did a heck of a job. They had a car show. Band, they had a car show. It was an amazing event. So we're looking for somebody else to do that. And when I say this stuff to you guys, we're not looking at you to do it. 
but in our networks, we know all these different people. So when I send out my 9 million emails, I hope you're broadcasting them to everybody that you know. Okay. And our Oktoberfest will be on October 13th. There you go. You think that, and then, and then uh, that takes the holiday party. This year, it will be a cruise on San Diego Bay. Okay. And if you're not a member, not that I'm looking at you. <laughs> you know, we'll be on the dock. We're leaving you at the dock. No, you're right. 150 bucks to be a, an affiliate. 50 bucks if you're a friggin' hospital engineer. We're at the point right now where as affiliates, we are paying for hospital engineers rather than sponsoring something else. 50 bucks, 200 bucks, 300 bucks, you can make six engineers a, uh, a member. We used to be the largest chapter in the state. There used to be 50, 60 people in here. COVID has really hammered us hard. So we're trying to come back. We were at 220 members, something like that. Now we're at 145. So we ask that you would all work as ambassadors of CSHE, invite the people that you know. Uh, uh, it's exciting when we have directors, hospital directors get on board and they want to they want to participate and managers and they have their people come. And again, we're offering a fun uh, uh, community environment to learn, right? COVID, COVID was nasty stuff, is nasty stuff. People are still uh, a part with it. It's very serious. Regardless of what people want to say in the news, we all know it's an entirely different thing when you're on the ground. When you have friggin' temporary morgues in the back of your hospital, you know it's pretty important stuff. So there's so many things to learn and keep up abreast of, and we're professionals of this industry. So please invite all your clients. Let's get people out to this stuff. Go to the fun events we did. We did we've done bowling this year. We did a Padre game this year. What's that? Oh, bowling and bowling. Yeah, that's right. So we do all that stuff to invite people and get people here to be part of the education. Right? Would you like me to drone on more? Is that enough? <laughs> Nick, Nick, we do everything. Just need yeah, uh, out at the beach. Robert yeah, Maxwell. Robert Maxwell. What's that, buddy? The Christmas party at the beach. Oh, we, well, that wasn't a Christmas party. Yes, we just went to the beach. That's exactly right. We had a picnic. Thank you. So, uh, anyways, this year we are doing. I mean, last year. Belmont Park. We did Belmont. Thank you. We did Belmont Park last year. That was very nice. And it was all set up. It was all beautiful. And the weather said it was going to be incredible. Ah, so uh, <laughs> this year we're just going to get on a. You know, it's going to be cold. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. On December 8th. I'm just saying he's got on that. <laughs> it's, he reads my emails. <laughs> okay, yeah. ready to start? Yeah. Okay. I'm happy to. Uh, Happy to announce tonight's presentation, Planning for Medical Gas Resiliency, presented by Dell Terry with FS Medical. Thank you, Dell and Brian, for putting this together for us at your facility. We very much appreciate it. Good to see all you guys here. Um, if you're a hospital engineer, you know, my hat goes off to you because uh, I think you guys have really rough jobs. <laughs> I really do. I mean, the amount of emails you get on a daily basis, I mean, it just drives you nuts, I'm sure. So I know you guys are in some difficult situations, been through COVID and that kind of thing. So I really, like I said, my hat's off to the engineers in the group. And, and I think for vendors that you're here, you know, you're like us, you know, vendors, and we really take our job seriously at the hospitals as well. So I, I know that you guys do here tonight. I'm not going to make it a terribly complicated, you know, presentation for people. So, you know, <laughs> because I sat next to you at dinner. <laughs> uh, but I, I, what we want to do tonight was go over some lessons learned, basically, as a result of COVID in, in Medgas. There were some things that just did not work out well in the world of Medgas as a result of COVID. And so I thought I'd go through some lessons learned and some of the things that some tactics that people not only here in the United States, but around the world are thinking about to try and improve the situation should something like that happen again. You may wonder why we had Hawaiian food tonight. And we have Hawaiian food tonight because Ryan is uh, from Hawaii in some respects, right? In all respects. In all respects. <laughs> in all respects. 
So, you know, when he, we came up with the menu, he said, you know, what, what should we have? Hawaiian, and it, he, he took care of it. So that was, it was a great call by just doing something like that. Amen. So in front of the screen? Okay, so I'll, I'll be navigating. I, I'm going to cover up the screen a little bit, so I'll navigate around so you can see. But the what's in, in behind me is just a little bit about me, so you can kind of get a sense of who I am and some what of my experiences have been. Uh, I told some people at dinner that I'm a Chicago kid, grew up in the Midwest, came out here as a result of the military. I was in the Air Force for a while during Vietnam and uh, uh, been in business here for 30 years. And so uh, I told uh, Gary that I, I make more money in one day in the company the whole year when I started the company 30 years ago. <laughs> Those days, I had no customers, you know, I had no customers. And so uh, that was a, a transition for me. There's a couple of things I'll be talking about tonight. I just wanted to give you a, a heads up on a couple of books that I'll be mentioning briefly. You don't have to memorize anything here, but this is what we kind of call the Bible of Medgas. It's NFPA chapter 99, and there's a whole series of chapters in the NFPA books. This book tells you if you're going to build an energy plant like Gary is over here at, at Radies, well, it tells you some of what you need to do there. If you're going to put in a remodel on a hospital, it tells you how to build it and so forth. If you're doing something at Grossmont, this will give you an indication of what's going on. What this book says is you have to be qualified to work in Medgas. Anybody that touches bed gas has to be qualified. It doesn't tell you how you do it. And so there's a separate book that is on an international basis that gives you the qualifications and the curriculum you need to go through to go to get those qualifications. And so whether you're working in Australia, the United States, or Canada, or India, or Japan, or anywhere, you're going to go through these same qualifications worldwide. And one of my uh, pleasures and tasks was to sit on the technical committee that writes this book. So, you know, I've seen a lot of drama associated with people that are just trying to decide, well, what qualifications do you need to have to be able to work in Medgas? And this book and the NFP book comes out every three years. And so this is the latest uh, that's out there. As far as what we do, you can see a little bit behind me on what FS does and kind of scan that over real quick. As far as service area, we work here on the West Coast. And then we also work in India and Japan. And so when I talk about this book being used internationally, the people I work with, the hospital side in Japan, are the same qualifications as here in the US. The people who are working on installers, doing brazing and that kind of thing in India, same thing, uh, same qualifications going on there. So it really is an, an international kind of environment. The reason we work in Japan and India is that uh, innovation happens first overseas in Medgas, not here in the United States. So we kind of get a preview of what's happening and coming our way as we work with other places around the world. So that's just a little bit of background about us. But what I wanted to do specifically with you tonight was to look at some of the assumptions that we had made going into COVID that turned out to be untrue. It just simply didn't work out the way we planned and what we're doing about those going forward. If you're been, those of you who've been around the O2 yard back in the back of the hospital, you'll notice that sometimes there was so much oxygen being used that things just froze up and there was just big giant ice balls on the things. And so people learned that uh, that wasn't sized correctly for the kind of events that were gonna take place. People also noticed that medical air compressors that typically don't run all the time were in fact running all the time and that the backup systems that were in place were running all the time as well. So those things just weren't sized correctly in addition to that. And beyond that, some of the pressures inside the hospitals uh, we have to have pressure on the gases to be able to force it into the anesthesia machines and force it in the ventilators and that kind of thing. We're below what was required. And we didn't have the ability in some cases to bump up the pressures enough to satisfy those machines. And so we got into some trouble there. So those are some key indicators that things were not working well in the world of med gas during COVID and not just here in San Diego, but elsewhere as well. So let's just go through a few assumptions that didn't work out. And then we'll talk about some steps that we're going to be taking to say, here's how we can do a better job the next time something serious comes around. It was a, a global situation where facilities just were not designed for this kind of event that we uh, experienced. 
One of the first assumptions that was made when hospitals was built was that not everybody was gonna be using oxygen at the same time. So in ICU and surgery, we knew that was gonna be true. Everybody was gonna be a you know, full house and everybody's gonna be on oxygen. But in a med surge bed situation, we have a lot of med surge beds at the hospitals, the theory was that only about 10% of the oxygen outlets were gonna be used simultaneously. Well, during COVID, that wasn't the case. We had a lot of people in room, 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 using oxygen. And so we got into trouble on, on that score. The probability was much, much higher than we had ever anticipated in the design work out there. Second assumption that we made was incorrect was that the pipe sizing that delivered medical gases in the hospital was adequate. And it wasn't. The pipe sizing was too small. What the graph up here shows is that as the flow rates go up, the restrictions on pressure, this is a drop of pressure of 1.2 pounds per square inch, for every 100 feet of pipeline in the building goes down dramatically for inch and a half. But if you're over here at four inches, the pressure only goes down less than you know, 0 0.02 uh, PSI. So the larger the pipeline, the less restrictions that are there and the more pressure we're able to deliver to the patients. So hospital world of the future, you're gonna find that pipeline sizing is going to be increased because we can just simply deliver more flow in that situation. Third assumption we made that was incorrect was that oxygen was gonna be readily available in the, at all times. It wasn't. Uh, in Mexico, for example, the cartels became involved in oxygen. So anything that you know the cartels could get involved with, whether drugs or whatever, and so the only oxygen was to go buy it from the cartels. They would hijack the delivery trucks. The O2 delivery trucks were hijacked, and you had to buy the oxygen from the gangs down there. In the United States, though, there just simply wasn't enough production for, to meet the needs. We not only had the hospital needs, but the main use of oxygen is not in hospitals, it's in industry. And so petroleum mining, for example, uses tremendous amounts of oxygen for the burners. Um, NASA had to delay some launches of rockets because they just couldn't get enough cryogenic oxygen for the fuel tanks and so forth. So we thought that we'd have enough and we did. And we suffered for that because some of the delivery trucks were late they only delivered a partial load sometimes, and we were consuming large amounts of oxygen. So that was a third assumption we made that didn't work out. The fourth assumption we made was that per Oshpod or HKI these days, that hospitals were designed to be a place of refuge. You could go there and that would be the last building standing. However, and with COVID, the more people we put together, the higher the infection rate was. And so we started distributing people out to a bunch of other facilities. Uh, whether it was a sports stadium or some kind of amphitheater, we wanted to get them distributed out and spread some distance between the COVID patients. It was hard to do. And the assumption were have to be correct, that we would always have enough space for refuge for people inside the hospitals. Hospitals were just basically jammed up and full. The assumption we made that was incorrect was that long-term care wouldn't be heavily impacted by an event like this. It was. A lot of older people just simply had tremendous problems with COVID. And so a lot of deaths were at uh, long-term care facilities. However, long-term care facilities in California and San Diego are notoriously behind the eight ball and keeping their facilities up to date. You know, their funding is low. Medi-Cal is most of the patient load and so forth. And so they had, you know, poorly trained staff, umpteen things that they had put on deferred maintenance and so forth. And so there was a real trouble situation with high oxygen use at long-term care facilities. And we learned that that needed to be better planned for in the future. And then the last assumption that we made that was incorrect was that the supply chain was gonna be adequate to give us the parts and pieces that we needed to make all this put together. And that wasn't the case. We found out that so much of healthcare supplies come from China and that when all the factories are producing at full bore, there just simply wasn't enough parts worldwide to make the needs uh, been out there. And so what you see behind me is uh, a factory where they manufacture what we call doers in the world of med gas. They're stainless steel containers that, control, that contain liquid product. And they were pumping them out like crazy, but it wasn't soon enough 
to meet the needs here in the United States or around the world. So uh, the global supply chain just simply did not work correctly during the situation. So those are the situations we were dealing with. Those are the six assumptions we made that were simply faulty. And so now the question is, what are we gonna do about it? What did we learn and where do we go from here? And so it was really a worldwide response. Um, a group called the International Association of Plumbing and Mechanical Officials <clears throat> grabbed the ball here and they set up a medical gas resiliency task force. This is a, a worldwide task force to look at what we can do now to prohibit something like this happening in the future. And that task force. And I can tell you that um, th there are ideas that are out there, but they're expensive. <laughs> it's the conversation difficult, very difficult. People have to, gonna have to spend money to do this. It also makes it difficult because it takes time to get these ideas into the code books, you know, the NFPA book that I showed you earlier. And it has to be approved then by 50 different states here in the United States. So that takes a while to get through as well. So the, the work is ongoing, but it is, uh, it is uh, difficult. And the goal here is to make enough modifications in the code where we can go forward and, and have a good success rate in the future. The first solution that we know about is to, rather than up, hospitals buying all their oxygen and having it delivered, hospitals can produce the oxygen on site. And so if they have an increased demand for oxygen, they would have their own oxygen plant where they could produce it without having to go to a supplier for it. And this is not brand new technology, the NFPA allows it. And so hospitals these days are considering in some situations whether they wanna have kind of a reserve supply based upon being able to produce it locally. And so that is something that, uh, again, proven technology involves an air compressor that eventually strips out the nitrogen and it goes on to the hospital. There's relatively pure oxygen out there. An example of this, this is one of our clients up in Ketchikan, Alaska. And you see on the, on the left, that's the delivery method they had at Ketchikan to get oxygen up to the hospital. It came up on ships on the inland passageway. So I don't know if Mm -hmm. Corky's been on a cruise on the end of the passageway or not, you know, but uh, but it is quite not a bit. Not on that one. Not on that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, they got through. so that's that's how oxygen came up to the hospital. And so it was unpredictable. So you can imagine if they had a situation like COVID, you know, well, wait a second, I can't get a ship up there overnight. You know, in bad weather, it could be taking place. You can see there's some vehicles on the on the Connex boxes there. And that's how people do maintenance on their trucks and cars. They take it down to the dock, they shove it into a Connex box, and it goes down to Seattle. There's very few auto repair places in Ketchikan that takes something like that. Comparison method is over there on the right, and that's the oxygen generation plant they have there. So they are totally independent from anything coming in from the ships or something like that. And they can reduce oxygen as they need here at the hospital. So that was kind of a nice method that they adopted out there. On an international basis, this is one of our clients over in India. And uh, in India, they had a, a, a lot of trouble just simply transporting all the oxygen around the country because the Indian infrastructure and roads leaves a little bit to be desired. And so this is a truck that you can see in the picture that was flown in on uh, a C-17 cargo plane that the United States sold Indian Air Force. And this came in from Germany. And so they were bringing in trucks that could distribute oxygen throughout the country. But eventually during the time of COVID, they put in a tremendous number of these O2 generation plants to serve hospitals. So they didn't have, they didn't have to worry about the truck going to the hospital. They could just produce oxygen from the atmosphere and have it locally at the hospital. And the numbers are just dramatic. I mean, there's three to 500 of these going in every month. You know, so the country's that big with that many hospitals out there. So that's something that uh, they consider. So that's solution number one, produce the oxygen locally. And there's codes that allow us to understand how best to do that. Another thing we could do in the world of med gas is to say, rather than having one unique pressure throughout the whole hospital, which typically in oxygen is between 50 and 55 PSI, we'll bump the pressure up and then we'll have downstream regulators at the special units in the hospital that might have more flow requirements. So let's say Gary over there has some more requirements over at NICU. Well, We'll just give him a regulator down there in that NICU area and let him play with it and give himself whatever pressures he wants there because we don't have to disturb med surge beds in another part of the hospital. So we can have some independent 
type of regulators that are out there. This is not something that's approved by FPA now, but it's something the committee is strongly considering. My guess is that in the 20, let's see, be the 24 book that comes out, my guess is that the pressure regulators that can be downstream will be part of that book. And that gives more flexibility to hospitals. Grossmont would be the same way. You could have something that might serve ICU or surgery at one pressure. You could have another pressure that would be delivering med surge, and you wouldn't have to worry about trying to set all the alarm panels all over again at the hospital. So things number two. And of course, if you were to do that, you'd have to have some pressure charts to give hospitals some guidance about how best to adjust those pressures. Another thing that's available to us that uh, we in our company you know, promote a lot, and that's making sure that you know how to make sure of this ancillary connection that's called the emergency oxygen supply connection. This started because of um, work in skyscrapers, actually. So when a fire department goes into a skyscraper, on the side of the wall of the skyscraper, on the exterior, is a box. And when the fire department shows up, they plug in a compressor to that box, and the air goes up inside the building. And every seventh floor, the fire department troops can recharge their backpacks on cylinders because every seventh floor, they've got picks, axes, hoses, extra cylinders, and so forth that can grab them and start using them in the buildings. So places like Google and skyscrapers in LA and skyscrapers in the Bay Area and so forth all you know, went down that path. It was a good idea. And so the hospitals grabbed onto it. And so emergency connections for oxygen were put in place on the exterior of the buildings for hospitals. And you have three of them because you have three different buildings there. So this is a way that we can get oxygen, extra oxygen to the hospital if we need to. But there's a, a catch here. The catch is it has to work. And so, yeah. and so what, one of the things the NFPA says now is you have to have the, the box there on each one of the buildings, but it doesn't say how often it has to be tested. So part of the resiliency task force is to make a recommendation to say, you need to test it periodically. And we're gonna define periodically as probably every year to make sure that the, when you need it, it's gonna be there and it's gonna be working correctly. Pipeline. Um, when you put in pipeline in a building, it's kind of, some of you guys have probably dealt with HVAC ducting and so forth. And so if you're dealing something with HVAC ducting, you wanna take a 90 degree turn. Do you put in an abrupt 90 degree turn? What do you do? You, you, you angle it over to 45, you make it a nice gentle curve so the air will flow around there. Because if it, if it slams into a 90 degree abrupt end point, there's a lot of restrictions there, a lot of resistance, and you'll lose a lot of the pressure coming there. It doesn't work well. Well, the same thing happens in Medgas. The more fittings we have in the world of Medgas, the more restrictions that are in the pipeline. And so the, in planning out pipelines, we want to eliminate as many fittings as possible, especially these 90 degree turns that you see here in this picture. Because every time that 90 degree event takes place, there is a length of pipe that would be equivalent to that that engineers have to plan for. And so one of the workarounds that's been approved by NFPA these days is to use something called corrugated medical tubing. And so when you flex this around the corners, you're guaranteed that you're not gonna have those abrupt 90 degree turns like that because it's gonna be a nice general radius that goes around there. So you'll have better flow going to the facility. Comes on big coils like that and uh, some hospitals are putting it uh, uh, in many places in the hospital. There's some things we can do immediately. Well, believe it or not, just checking for leaks regularly and repairing them can be go a long way. It's like the faucet at home. Um, if it's dripping a little bit over time, you'll get several gallons of water coming out of that thing. And so the same thing exists with repairing inlets and outlets. If you can keep up to date with it, when you have an emergency, you're not gonna have extra gas going into the atmosphere that you don't wanna lose out there. Second thing is that you can take a look at your demand studies and figure out exactly what your size needs to be for medical air and for oxygen. The code says you're supposed to do it every year for oxygen. It doesn't give you that recommendation for medical air, but I think a lot of people are saying right now, that it would be wise to say, what is our capacity of medical air really gonna to need to be in the days to come for an event like COVID? Maybe we're undersized for what is required out there. The new trend that's happening is that 
instead of just, um, if you go out to uh, an O2 tank for those of you that are vendors, on the big O2 tank, there's how many inches of liquid oxygen are in that vessel? And it kind of gives you an idea of, you know, how long it's going to last. You know, it's so many inches, 60, 80 inches, whatever. But it doesn't tell you the flow rate. It doesn't tell you how fast you're using it. And so technology has allowed us to hit install ultrasound on pipelines. And now we can put that ultrasound on the pipeline and we can tell what the flow rate is going into our hospitals. So we can do a better job of planning what our trend rate is on the usage of O2. We don't have to wait for the gauge to go down a few inches. We know based on the liters per minute that we're using where we need to be on, on planning for an event that might give us some trouble on, on satisfying patient needs. So that's some technology that's been a really good deal. We're doing a hospital up at Sacramento and right now, and, and every one of those lines coming in from O2 yard have those flow meters on it, the ultrasound flow meters on it. Standard during the days to come. Uh, keeping our compressors current to make sure they work correctly and don't have any downtime out there. And uh, testing the EOC box in the of course, as well. When you have an event where you need to have an EOC box uh, uh, involved, then you can't just back up a big tanker truck to the EOC box. You have because the tanker truck is filled with what? Liquid O2. Well, we don't breathe liquid O2, we breathe gaseous O2. So you have to convert the liquid to a gas before it goes into the hospital. So therein lies a little bit of trick. So you need to have the right fittings and hoses and connectors and that kind of thing. And so I had these guys lay out one. There's some on the table back there, the little manifolds, some of the hoses. Those are the kind of things you need to be able to make sure the hookup works out. And is that we need to have uh, better supplies in our shops. Now, Believe it or not, the parts that we're, we're getting quoted from some manufacturers days, just from, from just Monday, we are ordering some pumps and motors for compressors, January of 23. January of 23. I mean, give me a break. You know, January, which means when they tell you that, they don't know. <laughs> that's really what they mean. That's really what they're telling you. They don't know. They don't, they, yeah, they're just guessing out there. So having those pumps and compressors there as backups, I think is, is pretty important to be able to supply yourself the time of need out there. In the 21 book of NFPA, there's a position that's gonna be required of all hospitals and it's called a responsible facility authority. And here's how it works. We do some classes for engineers and let's say that Corky's in my class. And he's on the phone right now, and I know he's paying attention to me. Right <laughs> I know, I know. So let's say I go to Corky and I say, Corky, at this hospital, who's responsible for medical gas? And he looks at his daughter, and he looks at himself, and he looks at Gary over here, and he looks at Ryan over here, and he says, Well, you know, we all, we all are. And the NFPA says that's not the way it should work. You should have one person that says, I'm in charge of medical gas here at the hospital. All the reports go through me, you know, and I'm going to be the person that's going to be the educated guy or gal to make sure that everything's working correctly on the gas. So that uh, responsible facility authority will be a person that will have a better handle on the facility's med gas needs, the condition of the facility, and so forth. In the world of the regulations, there's three types of categories people can fall into in, in, in med gas. It's a category where you're just interested in funding. You want to make sure that Medicare and Medi-Cal and the insurance companies pay you, right? That's category one. That's a very important category. Well, the minimum of the, of the NFPA, that's the JCO minimum standard. If you're in the Oshpod world or HK, then they're going to say, well, that's pretty dug on old and we're building a hospital. We don't want to use old code. And so we're going to have a more updated one. And today in California, HK uses the 2018 version rather than the 2012. Out there. But if you're a government hospital, if you're the, if you're the Navy at Balboa, those guys have to maintain what they call an industry standard. And so those have to main, per Congress, have to be on the latest version of the code out there. So this code is coming your way. And I, I believe the sooner you get ready for it, the better off you're gonna be. But that was be one solution to be having a, an immediate option 
getting ready for the next hurdle, whatever that might be coming up. Some people are very prone to do value engineering, and we, we get that. I mean, we want to have the hospitals designed as efficiently as possible. But sometimes value engineering doesn't necessarily give you the best bang for the buck in an emergency situation because you chanced the dollar so low that you really haven't planned for the future out there. So just be watchful of that. And then I know that uh, maintenance is uh, what I call a Cinderella topic out there. You know, it's a beautiful lady. I keep her happy out there. And so uh, you go to the VP and say, I need $300,000 to do something. And he says, well, uh, it's not broke. You know, <laughs> why, why, why don't you spend that? I don't see that, Gary. I mean, you know, it's not broken. And you're trying to say, well, but it's proactive. You know, we can keep our hospital up to date and that kind of thing. So you have those arguments and win those arguments on uh, proactive maintenance. Well, if, and it's a big if, if nothing comes our way again, um, if we do some of these things that I think are relatively simple, you know, in concept, but, you know, have some bucks associated with it, and if we can do this on a nationwide and, in fact, on a worldwide basis, we'll be better prepared to deal with an outage or a COVID situation in the days to come, I believe. And that's what we're, that's what we're trying to do. And the big things, COVID is kind of a minor situation. In the big scheme of humanity, COVID is here for a while. Hopefully, you're going to get over it. You know, you know you're going to be getting shots on a yearly basis, perhaps. But, you know, I, I believe I'm probably the oldest person in this room. And, and I can tell you that uh, uh, you, you may be older. Uh, 68. 68. I got you beat. I'm 72. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, um, so I've seen some things in my 72 years that were pretty bad. <laughs> and uh, and COVID's, COVID's not a good thing, but things do pass a bit. And so we'll figure something out and, and go. So that's, that's something I want to leave with you. But um, one of the things that probably isn't going to go away is the climate change situation. And so whether it's wildfires and other things that, you know, climate change situation can be very bad for us in the hospital world. Wildfires especially, the picture I have down at the bottom is from a medical air compressor that had gone through a wildfire smoke ingestion. So you can see on the left, the color of the filter there and the filter, that's one of the right is the way it should be. So, you know, when we have wildfires or the certain events that are calamities in our area, we really have to take care of it from a, a medical gas standpoint. Um, when the, Fires went through Northern California around Santa Rosa, you remember a number of years ago. It was just a terrible set of fires up there, terrible. And uh, hospitals evacuated. They evacuated without turning off a bunch of equipment. They just left because the fire was right at the doorstep. And so when you went back in, filters were clogged up. I mean, you know, the whole thing needed to be cleaned. Medgas pipeline was totally trashed out because debris had gotten into the pipelines and so forth. So. So there are some of these things that make it difficult to get hospitals back in operation and to be able to respond in an emergency situation out there. So uh, that's my presentation. What I've done is to go through with you some assumptions that were faulted, some assumptions that we made in code, you know, after lots of study and learning that didn't work out. I've gone over a few things that the international front is trying to think of in the days to come that will help us withstand things in the future. And I've gone over some I think some practical today type of things you can do to make your med gas system more resilient if some calamities or troubles would come your way. So, again, thank you very much for being here tonight. I enjoyed meeting all of you and uh, eating with you and so forth. If there's any